Yeah, so today we're very happy to have Dr. Masumi Yamada here today sharing with us on earthquake early warning in Japan. Dr. Masumi Yamada is an assistant professor in Disaster Prevention Research Institute from Kyoto University. As we all know that Japan is among one of the very first countries that issued earthquake early warning system on the national level. So today, Dr. Masumi Yamada will be talking about integrated particle filter and propagation of local undamped motion methods implemented in the earthquake early warning system in Japan. Before the sharing starts, please allow me to go through the agenda and housekeeping rules. Yep, so the agenda of today is we will be having 35 minutes of presentation and um, we will leave roughly, ideally, 20 minutes for questions and discussion and five minutes for wrap up. And here are some virtual facilitation and etiquette rules. And please put your name on the screen and be mindful on being on mute and also practice skillful listening. And we try to avoid interrupting the speaker, jot down notes, and you can all use chat box. And demonstrate mutual respect for everyone's perspectives, pace, and journeys, and presume positive intentions. Cool. Now I will, I'm assuming Yamada, you can begin sharing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for a very nice uh, introduction. And uh, I actually have been to New Zealand twice uh, to install a seismometer after 2011 Christchurch earthquake. And I spent, I was in New Zealand on March 11 on the day of Tohoku earthquake. So after I went back to uh, Japan, like everybody asked me, well, why are you drain earthquake? And I, that was a common question for among seismologists. And I always say, oh, I was in New Zealand on the day. So I missed the shaking of Tohoku earthquake. So like 2011 Tohoku earthquake is one of the very big major earthquake and very like important earthquake in Japan, like for the Japanese people. And I was going, I'm going to uh, explain the earthquake early warning, how the earthquake early warning system uh, performed uh, among, uh, during the Tohoku earthquake. So let me turn off my camera so that you can focus on the, my presentation. Okay, so the, on the Tohoku uh, earthquake was a cut offshore earthquake. So that occurs, the, you know, the away from the Japanese island. So it takes uh, 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 20 seconds to for, so the P wave arrive at the island and then like the seismometer detected P wave. And just a second after the P wave detection, like the major Japan Meteorological Agency uh, recognized, oh, this is very big earthquake, so we should give the earthquake early warning. So we successfully provide uh, earthquake early warning to public people by cell phone and TV and etc. And uh, because we have uh, so many seismic network, it's in real time sending the data. Like about three minutes after the earthquake, we have observed seismic intensity, which was reported on the TV. And about three and a half minutes later, like uh, JMA issued tsunami warning. So how much warning time we had uh, for the shaking arrival and tsunami arrival? This left figure shows like how much, how many seconds we had after the warning was issued. So you can see the closest location, it's about 10 seconds before the, S wave, uh, secondary wave arrival. And the main city of Sendai area, it's about like 30 seconds. And in Tokyo, about one minute before the strong shaking arrival. And also tsunami, like it takes about 30 minutes uh, to travel 
but the warning was issued only three minutes later after the earthquake. So in terms of in terms of timing of warning, uh, like both uh, earthquake early warning and tsunami warning was successfully provided to public people. Why we can do this, uh, you know, providing earthquake early warning to public people, we need three important uh, components to provide warning, warning message. So the most important thing is seismic network. We uh, need to, uh, we need data, seismic sh data of shaking. So Japan Meteorological Agency and also Nash NYED National uh, Institute of Earthquake Disaster, uh, they installed so many seismic stations in entire country. You can see that red one is GMA and the uh, yellow one is a uh, high uh, NID network. So you can see it's almost entire country. It's very homogeneous distribution and it's very dense everywhere in Japan. And also there are some offshore stations. This is ocean bottom seismometer. It's very new, like this couple of years after the Tohoku earthquake. It's installed after Tohoku earthquake. So it helps to detect those offshore earthquake as quick as possible. And here is a New Zealand, it's about the same scale. And uh, you can compare, you can see the density of this uh, East Coast is about the same, about the same, and maybe like uh, less, uh, less uh, denser in the East and the South part. But I think the density itself is uh, not, uh, it's capable to provide earthquake early warning for this seismic network density. density. And uh, the second important thing is uh, the inf uh, information technology. We need to provide warning information as quick as possible. So this is a flow, how we send uh, the warning message to public people. We have uh, many sensors and the send the data to Japan Meteorological Agency every like 1.0.1 second. And GMA computed process those data and determine whether it's bigger earthquake or small shaking. And then if it starts, the GMA is going to provide warning message on TV, radio, cell phone, or like secondary provider. And also it's also directly used to control trains or factories. So all this flow has to be very quick. It's uh, in Japanese case, it's less than one second providing this early warning message. And well, so it's a warning message is provided to the cell phone, each cell phone that I'm going to show you my cell phone. It's my phone is very old, but like you can hear the ringtone of earthquake early warning. Let me. So this we we, we this sound is uh, the tone for earthquake early warning. So it's the same. All the phone has the same ringtone. So once you know larger earthquake occurs and early warning was provided, all the phone in this country start ringing with the same ringtone. And we also have this short message like earthquake occurred somewhere and prepare for strong shaking. But this is a very short message because you don't have enough time to read and respond. So they just say like what you should do, just prepare for strong shaking. That is a message, it comes up on the, your, the cell phone, on your cell phone. And after Tohoku earthquake, JMA, Japan Meteorological Agency have some survey like how to receive an earthquake early, how you received the earthquake early warning message. And most people received the message by cell phone because you always have cell phone with you. And maybe some people who is watching TV, they are, it's 
uh, saw the warning message on the TV. Like TV, they have like automatically pops up the, you know, the warning message was automatically popped up. So the, when people are watching TV, like it's every, every entire country, everywhere in Japan, like you can see those warning message where earthquake occurred and the warning, the shaking is uh, where the large shaking will be observed. So another thing is like town speaker or uh, like, like some app on PC or say a radio also provide or speak early warning, but it's just minor, minor case. So you can see the cell phone is really important right now. And also automatic message on TV, like some people do receive by TV through TV. Okay, so the third important component to provide our security warning message is the knowledge of seismology because we have to tell this is large shaking, this is gonna be large shaking or small shaking. So we have to do it very quickly. That is the difficulty because this is a seismic waveform from smaller stick at the bottom to larger stick on top. And you can see the small earthquake is very like high frequency and also very short, whereas large earthquake, it's very long period ground motion and it continues forever. But the difficulty of earthquake early warning is you have to tell very quickly, ideally first few seconds, whether this is small earthquake or large earthquake. So in that case, you probably can tell these are small earthquake, but it's very difficult to tell how large it's going to be, magnitude six, seven, eight. It's very difficult to tell at the beginning of the earthquake. So what we are doing, we are going to update. Every second we are going to update and report like how large currently, and then once they exceed some threshold, to provide warning message to public people, we give this warning message to the area with where large shaking is going to be expect expected. So like oh, I, I told, I said the warning was properly provided in terms of the timing for the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. But there are some lessons we learned from Tohoku earthquake because there are some events which didn't work very well. And the first problem is accuracy for aftershocks because there are so many aftershocks in entire country after the Tohoku earthquake. Sometimes it's very far away, but two earthquake occurs almost at the same time. So before the Tohoku earthquake, uh, JMA, Japan Meteorological Agency, provided 70 warnings. And among them, five of them have large errors. But after Tohoku earthquake, about two months after the Tohoku earthquake, JMA provided 70 warnings. And more than 60% of them have large intensity errors. So this is because Sometimes two earthquake occurs at the same time, and it's both of them are very small, but the system cannot recognize this is two earthquake. So the system thought, oh, this is one big earthquake which shake very wide area, and then the early warning was provided in those area, but actually it's just two very small earthquakes, so there are very minor shaking. So that kind of pro, uh, a warning, mis a false alarm occurred many times after the Tohoku earthquake. And the second problem is underestimation of the shaking for the main shock. So uh, the earthquake early warning system in Japan currently are located on earthquake, and then the shaking is computed uh, the function of distance from the hypocenter. 
So you can see this is hypocenter, and it's all shaking, estimated shaking is cir circle. And uh, it's just because this is just a function of uh, hypocenter distance. However, the reality is like that. This is observed seismic intensity during the Tohoku earthquake. Uh, as you know, the rupture was about 500 kilometers to north and south. So you can see Tohoku, uh, Tokyo area, they have a very large uh, shaking intensity, but because the estimated shaking is uh, as a function of hypocenter, which is very far away. So we estimated very small shaking. So we did not provide warning message to the people in Tokyo by cell phone. So people in Tokyo did not receive the early warning message on the cell phone. So the issue is they didn't receive it, but they felt very large shaking in this Tokyo area. So this is a second problem during the Tohoku earthquake. So JMA uh, and also like uh, including me was working on how we can improve the earthquake early warning system after the Tohoku earthquake. So here is a history of earthquake early warning. In Japan, we started the warning, earthquake early warning, providing to public people in 2007. And after that, there are a couple of uh, force alarms, which I don't talk much detail today, but one of them at Tohoku earthquake. And then there are minor, minor improvements. They added new stations, they added backup batteries, or like, you know, they added small uh, improvements. The major improvements was made 2016 IPF method and 2018 PROM method. So I'm going to uh, explain what these two uh, IPF and PROM method uh, so this is just advertisement JMA made after they installed two, two new uh, system. And they say that like, for the improvement of earthquake early warning. So uh, how they change the earthquake early warning system. So IPF is based on the conventional approach which uh, first we determine the location, and then we determine the magnitude and location, and then we compute the shaking intensity as a function of distance from the hypocenter. So that is a conventional approach, and IPF is update of the conventional approach. Whereas PROM method, this is a new concept. They are uh, or near almost real time or near future intensity report. So I'm gonna explain this later. So we combine these two methods, PRAM and IPF. And then like when we give the warning message, we take the bigger one, bigger, larger scale of these two methods. And then based on that uh, uh, two, shaking intensity, larger one of two intensity, like we provide the warning to public people. So first is uh, the, what is the difference between IPF and conventional approach? So IPF is uh, integrated particle filter, which uh, discriminates uh, two or multiple earthquakes, which occurs at the same time. But this is based on the conventional source determination approach. So uh, what the conventional approach, as I said, first locate, estimate the location, and then based on the shaking uh, amplitude, shaking amplitude at the seismometer and the location, uh, the distance from the epicenter, we compute the magnitude. And then based on the magnitude and distance, we can compute 
the shaking intensity, estimated shaking intensity at each location. But the second part, third part is just the equation. This is a simple uh, substitution. So these two, step two, step three are very easy. The most difficult part is step one, estimating location from the P wave arrival times. So conventionally, we performed grid search. So we essentially minimized the observed P wave arrival time minus estimated P wave arrival time for each uh, grid for potential location of an earthquake. And then try to find which grid is going to minimize this residual and then just uh, pick the most op optimal location by using this grid search. But the problem of this grid search, uh, the conventional approach, is you know if many earthquakes occur at the same time, it's uh, very difficult to distinguish two earthquakes. For example, currently uh, the ob ob uh, conventional approach they use only the P wave arrival time of triggered station. So like as I, this as like this figure, if earthquake two earthquakes, small earthquake occurs at a distance place, it's very difficult to tell it's two small earthquakes. And then they combine all this phase as a single event, and then they determine the location in the middle. That is a problem of a conventional approach. So new approach, uh, they use this new IPF method, use the information that all other station did not receive P wave. So we also use that information of non-triggered station. And also we also use amplitude information because amplitude is, we think amplitude is decays as a function of distance from an earthquake. So if I use that information, it's impossible to be, the location is to be here because you know around the station around here, they, have, they didn't receive any P wave arrival and amplitude is really small and noiseable. So it cannot be earthquake in, in between this here. So it, this phase and this phase should be different, two different earthquakes. So we determine two different earthquakes and then locating an earthquake based on this information. So that is a new concept of IPF uh, approach, IPF method. So we just, uh, this is just the results for the Tohoku earthquake. We performed continuous, two months continuous waveforms. And then the IPF method uh, provided, may provide 26 morning, and then only four of them have a very large error. So that means this 44 fourth alarm was decreased to only four uh, warnings. So it's this method is significantly improved for the multiple aftershocks, very active seismicity after the larger earthquake. So here is one of the example how we associate phase. So this, uh, there are two earthquakes, only a few seconds apart, and then very distant, very different places. And this triangle is shows a trigger station. So first couple of station triggered here. So IPF quickly determined the star is a location of an, uh, of an earthquake. And then this station triggered. But this station are very far away. It cannot be the same earthquake based on the phase arrival time and also amplitude because it's very far away, but still very big amplitude. So it's impossible to be the same earthquake. So IPF created another earthquake, which is showing this blue star. So the IPF properly like, associated to our phases 
P wave arrival, P wave phases, P phases from two different earthquakes. So this earthquake was determined by these 50 stations, and this earthquake was determined at this 50 stations. So we did not use all other stations, only the stations close to the first trigger station was used to determine the location. So that is the uh, performance of IPF method. The second one, a uh, PRAM method. Uh, this is a new approach. Well, it's based essentially front detection approach when the waveform is approaching to your place. So the conventional source determination approach or like IPF method, as I showed in the movie, the IPF method used a seismometer very close to the source and then determine the location and the magnitude from shaking of the seismometer close to the source. And then they compute the shaking at the target, at your target site. So it's, you can compute the estimated shaking for entire country once you determine the location and magnitude of a single earthquake. Where it's PROM method is different because PROM method does not determine the location of an earthquake. So it doesn't matter how large it was the earthquake or where the earthquake is, PROM method only uses the seismometer very close to your place. So once the waveform is propagate, you know, and then it's approach to your place, then the, this, once this size shaking of this cross seismometer exceeded some threshold, they will give the warning message to your place. So that is a front detection approach of uh, uh, the basic idea of a problem method. So more detail of PRAM method. They are using uh, 30 seismometer within 30 kilometers. So let's say this is a shaking intensity. And in Japan, like intensity 4.5 is a threshold to provide warning message. So they take the largest shaking intensity among this uh, like five stations within 30 kilometers from your target site. And then once one of the largest one was exceeded the threshold, they will give you the warning to this target site. And they consider the site amplifi amplification factor if this station is more like, you know, like amplification is larger than other place in, in average they add those extra amplification factor, and then the estimated shaking intensity is going to be 4.7, and then that exceeds the threshold, and it gives to the warning to the tar your target site. That is uh, what we are using, uh, the algorithm we are using for PRAM method currently. So uh, as you probably can see, they have a benefit, advantage and disadvantage for those two methods because IPF is using the seismometer very close to the source. The speed is faster because they can also provide the warning message to entire country once you determine the location of the earthquake. However, the IPF method is, the accuracy of IPF method is not so large, not so good because it uses only the information very close to the source. And also they need to consider the attenuation and GMP, ground motion prediction equation. All those factors uh, accumulate some error to estimate the shaking intensity. Whereas the PROM method, because PROM method use the waveform information very close to your press. The Speed is not so, the warning time is not as long as IPF, but the accuracy is very good. 
it's very difficult to make a mistake because you only use uh, site information within 30 kilometers at your place. So all those uh, info, uh, the error regarding to the attenuation or pass or source will be removed uh, by using this plum method. So those like, we are using this hybrid method like IPF plus uh, plum. If IPF missed the large earthquake or it's underestimated an earthquake, still plum method can give a warning because large shaking is really approaching to your place. So that is what we are doing for the Japanese warning, uh, earthquake early warning system. And for example, this is the example of Tohoku earthquake original method, original Japanese early warning system. And you can see the large shaking area is very like, you know, uh, observation was very uh, uh, wide area from north to south. But the original method, like estimated intensity, was as a function of the distance from this epicenter. So you can see it's all circle, circle. So very bad uh, estimation, underestimated significantly in this Tokyo area. However, if we use the PRAM method, because you know, you, the, these station, these sites use the uh, information within 30 kilometers from this place. They are like the difference is much smaller. It's very accurate prediction for this uh, PRAM method. So uh, this is the summary of uh, accuracy of warning for the Japanese uh, earthquake early warning. Every year we have this is a number of warning to public people. Like 2011, due to the Tohoku earthquake and aftershock, we had about 100 warnings. But except this year, like we have about 10 to 20 warnings uh, every year. And we had uh, also accuracy, which is uh, this accuracy means the estimated intensity is plus within plus minus one which we call accurate uh, warning. And you can see that 2011 accuracy was decreased significantly, but then like after the improvement of PRAM and uh, IPF, accuracy is uh, improved. And uh, currently we have about like 90% of accuracy, which uh, like most of the warning is plus minus one. Or even like after, uh, except this, we have plus minus within plus minus two, the shaking intensity is plus minus two. So, so far, like warning seems to be working pretty well. So we keep uh, an eye on the accuracy and also the improvement of the algorithm of our early warning system. Okay, here is a summary slide. We have uh, lessons we learned from 2011 Tohoku earthquake. We uh, did not prepare for multiple earthquake, which occurs at the same time at the distance place. So we confused the system confused. It's a single large earthquake, but actually it's a multiple two small earthquakes. And also we had some underestimation of shaking. Uh, which is far away from the hypocenter for the main shock because the rupture is really large for the main shock and we did not include that information in the warning system. So uh, we had update of the Japanese early warning system. One is IPF method, which is based on the conventional source determination approach, but we can, you know, classify multiple earthquakes uh, uh, and also we have those almost near future real time uh, shaking report, which is a PRAM method, which will cover the if IPF method significant shaking, I, PRAM method still can, you know, uh, give a warning to your place. So, so currently these two methods seems to working pretty well. So we still, you know, keeping, uh, making an effort, keep making effort to improve the warning system. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Masumi Yamada. And now we will have our questions and answer session and um, let's give it to Marion Tan. 
Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you for your presentation, um, Masumi. It was uh, really good, very interesting, and really learned a lot. Um, so we have a few questions, and I invite everyone to put in their questions on the uh, chat, chat box as well. So first question we have from Martha Savage. Um, so her question is, will Plum and IPF together help um, better tsunami wa warnings? Good tsunami. Um, Uh, I'm not sure. I currently promise included to the tsunami warnings. Actually, the output of uh, I think the first IPF uh, source uh, location and magnitude will be used as the initial estimate for tsunami warning. But actually, tsunami warning itself have different another uh, algorithm to estimate uh, you know how large the tsunami is going to be. So it's not the only the information by uh, source uh, based on the earthquake early warning, but like that information will be used at the initial initial parameter, initial location. So, uh, which definitely will help to improve that tsunami warning. Thank you, thank you for that. So Caroline Holden, um, just uh, want to thank you for your great presentation. And um, she asked, um, how do you wait IPF and PLUM when issuing warnings? Are you, or do you weigh or don't weigh? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so this is something I we can still improve the warning system because currently, uh, like, if, you know, the, this weight is just to pick the larger one. So two methods will estimate the shaking intensity, for example, Kyoto. In Kyoto, like intensity four or intensity five. So they will take the larger one, the larger number, and then based on that, they will give the warning to that. But as I said, uncertainty of two methods are different. So it's not very logical to just take the bigger one. But at the same time, speed is also different because IPF keeps the faster and then RAM will be later. So that, uh, factor also need to be considered, but currently we just pick the maximum of two method, two values. I see. So yeah, so that's, um, you're taking maximum, but I guess this is an area of future studies and future improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll be very excited to learn more about that as that moves along. Um, so we have a question from Derek Finn. Um, do the public get two warnings, one from IPF and then Plum, or how do they kind of mm -hmm. receive the warning. Yeah. No, no, uh, so public people receive only just one warning. So one, just only one, because, uh, you know, they may pick the larger value of two, two, you know, estimation, and then just they may give the warning, just one. But the problem is if, okay, they may overestimate, so they already issued the warning, and then, they do, but and then it's actually smaller than they expected but they don't provide cancellation information. So just only once of uh, earthquake early warning message, and uh, there is no cancellation, what like if it's mistake or whatever, it just, you know, if it scores, it, it, they just, it just goes, so they yeah. don't cancel, <laughs> yeah. I see, and then I guess just a follow-up question from me on that one. So for example, if a warning was issued by Plum, then there's mm -hmm. no source information, right? So does the public just get warned that shaking will start mm -hmm. and no other information on the source of the... No other okay. information of source. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very difficult to make a mistake uh, for the problem because they, you know, they already observed some uh, large shaking very close to your place. So it's very difficult to make a mistake. Whereas IPF, it's high chance to make a mistake, especially offshore, in, uh, like island, uh, earthquake in Ireland, which have very few seismometers. So the uncertainty of, uncertainty of two methods are very different. And, and I guess this follows up with um, Caroline's um, qu question as well. So what we saw from your presentation, IPF still had four warnings. And what were some of the, er the reasons for these errors? It's actually location was really good, but for example, it's a issue of a GMP or a site amplification factor because currently we have just single number for site amplification. So like 
okay, let's say Kyoto is like 2.5. So we always multiply 2.5 for the location for Kyoto. But that the site of amplification factor may be frequency dependent or like other things. And also GMPE, like if it's like super shallow earthquake, the GMP accuracy of GMP, a ground motion prediction equation, may not be so accurate. If it's really shallow and right, right underneath of your place, maybe they have pretty large, you know, the shaking intensity, but that's not included in the GMP. But like those four warning errors, it's not, you know, so significant. I checked all of them, but the location or estimation itself is okay. But there are like some minor, like, you know, the factor which cause, you know, certain error which exceeding that our threshold. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Raj. Um, he says that we have some, we have seen that researchers recent, recently introduced the algorithm alpha, which seems to use a, an approach quite similar to plum, but can provide warning beyond 30 kilometers. So do you have any insights about um, alpha as an algorithm and its usefulness? Uh, I'm not really sure about alpha, but the PROM method is currently they are using very, very basic uh, idea of a PROM method. They are going to like uh, update that, uh, including the wave propagation approach. So that probably, yeah, it's a like next step of PROM, but uh, currently just they are using very simple algorithm, which is 30 kilometers among 30 kilometers. And that number, 30 kilometer, is also very, very carefully choos chosen. Like they, are, they have studied like 10 kilometer, 20, 30, 40. And then if it's too large, the error is going to be large. And if it's too short, the one time is really short. So they compromise those two factors and determine the 30 kilometers for Japanese uh, network density. Thank you. And I guess this is a follow up in the discussion about the 30 kilometers. So a question from Masika um, is that uh, Plum uses sensors within 30 kilometers to issue warning. And then when warning time may be always less than 10 seconds. And how do we kind of uh, issue warning beyond 30 kilometers? Um, is there yeah, a comment on that? How you I issue think, warning? Yeah. yeah, currently they don't issue warning. With, uh, like if it's beyond 30 kilometers. But like, I think they are right, right now currently uh, making uh, uh, like improvement, improved algorithm which you can beyond like 30 kilometers. But current like, system do not issue warning beyond 30 kilometers. Yeah. So you have to wait until the waveform approached within 30 kilometers at your place. Yeah. So I'll just um, I'll follow up on that one from Martha. Um, so will there be a possibility for the 30 kilometer limit change in other, in other networks with you know, smaller density? Yeah, it really depends on the seismic net, uh, network. So you should uh, study for that, uh, tuning that, that 30 kilometer parameters. But it fits for Japanese network density right now. Uh, OK, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Raj. Um, do you have a choice to opt out from receiving a warning? Um, so do users have a choice to set their own threshold to receive a warning? I guess this is from a public perspective. Uh, actually, actually, uh, there is no choice for that. So it's only like so one, only one single threshold. But in Japan, like it's very complicated. Earthquake early warning has two two warnings. So we say one is warning, one is estimate. So warning, that earthquake already warning, warning will be provided to public people and they cannot change, you know, those mm. thresholds. But earthquake already warning estimate, it's you have to pay to get the information. So in that case, you can change the threshold as you like. For example, you are a like special user or train or company or factories. So you want to have a warning for smaller threshold. And then if you buy those information, you can change the threshold. So there are two, two warnings. Yeah. So the other ones for more special users and maybe industry and factories and trains. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Amal. Um, so 
do you process both plum and ipf at a central location oh uh, yes or, yeah yes yes same way yeah And I think, um, yeah, we probably touch up on this question. Uh, can the public get earthquake early warning? Oh, so, yeah, so a different question, sorry. Um, can the public get earthquake early warning from private commercial providers as well as the national system? Or, yeah, so are there different systems and are there private commercial providers that would provide earthquake early warning? Yeah, so the, that, you know, the early warning estimate will be provided, like, you know, the original source is only one, like JMA, Japanese for uh, the government. But then government will sell that information to commercial providers. And even public people can buy those information from the commercial provider. But that is going to be the early warning estimates because the earthquake early warning warning will be, you know, provided by cell phone and TV. But if you want to have more specific information, you can buy those information from commercial, provi pri commercial providers. But the source is only one. So it's all same information, which is provided by JMA. So what that is uh, uh, like restricted by law. So only JMA mm -hmm. can provide the original I see. source. I see. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, we also have Steve Taylor who's thanking you for your really good presentation. And just a question about the uh, concerning the small number of inaccurate alarms. Is there much public backlash um, for the false warning sent out, or the, is the public um, generally quite understanding if a warning is issued which does not eventuate? I think in general, like for our Japanese people. Like public people are really patient for the false warnings. There are multiple those false alarms, which you know, where like we, uh, ex uh, we had uh, we estimated seven, but there is no shaking at all. But still, like public people accept those false alarms. So, like it's because I think people really care earthquakes in Japanese country. So. People think, you know, seismology is really important, earthquake protection is really important. So the, the knowledge of uh, earthquake is higher than other countries. That probably yeah, connect to, to the acceptance for the force around. But we still need to, you know, keep uh, working on improvement. Oh, thank you for that. Um, so we have a comment from Keith. Uh, I guess in New Zealand, um, there's some commercial providers um, doing on-site earthquake early warning. And I guess an example would be um, uh, the, during the Kaikoura earthquake, um, some clients in Wellington got a 19 second warning. But I think as you explained in Japan, you have um, a, a law um, in terms of who can issue warnings. Is that right, Masumi? Yeah, yes, oh, well. yes. It's a government law which, you know, controls those, you know, issues on the Japanese government, like JMA. All right, thank you for the clarification. Um, so we have a question from Alicia. Um, how long did it take for the government to educate the public about, you know, earthquake knowledge and when the mm -hmm. um, earthquake early warning was going to be implemented? So like when 2007, the like, JMA uh, issued a uh, started early warning system. They have lots of education, public education, lecture, or TV, commercial, or, uh, many, many, like lots of efforts they did. Mm -hmm. But first couple of years, there is not so much uh, larger earthquake and many people did not know the system. But I think it's after Tohoku earthquake because everybody experienced this warning message and then they think, what is this? And then people, after the experience, they start gradually, you know, start uh, understanding the system. And uh, yeah, so I think experience is a major, major <laughs> progress to yeah, educate public people. <laughs> Yes, I think that's right. Um, yeah, um, I guess lived experience, experience of earthquakes and warnings. And mm -hmm. for my own curiosity, especially with, you know, um, the improvements with IPF and PLUM, mm -hmm. is this also communicated to the public? What are the new, new stages of earthquake early warning and what's kind of, you know, yeah. Yes, I, oh yeah, of course, like GMA did press the release, so thanks, but I think Public people don't care like the improvements. They just <laughs> cares, you know. They receive it and it's accurate or not.
but they don't care the you know, details. So I don't think people really know that, you know, just these improvements was, yeah, yes, on progress. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was, but that's good to know that um, people are, um, you know, informed as well if they're interested. But yeah. yes, I think you're absolutely right there. Um, so we have a question from Amal and asking, do you apply a plum algorithm on professional sensor data? Oh, what, what do you mean? The professional uh, sensor data? Yeah, yeah, Amal, if you um, can unmute yourself and maybe ask this question to clarify. Yeah, thank you, um, Marian. Yeah. Uh, um, so what, what, I'm, what I meant was uh, because now we are currently working on a project where we are looking at the more affordable sensors so that uh, they are not like, uh, like in, in, in New Zealand context, uh, what the GNS uh, or organized, Crown organization like that uh, possess uh, those sensors. So a sensor which has also some level of uh, processing capacity. So, um, so the, my question was around, so you get uh, that, because you are already networked and getting the data to the central location at GMA, GMA mm. and where you apply both uh, the traditional uh, and an improved traditional uh, algorithm as well as PLUM to that mm -hmm. data? Or, or you are looking at uh, this uh, processing in a more distributed manner? Oh, uh, actually, like PLUM method and IPF uh, stage, seismic station and PLUM method is slightly different because uh, our PLUM method include more stations because PLUM method have, does not require so much accuracy. Uh, IPF method needs in, to pick, detect the P wave arrival time, but PRAM is only like all oh, lights shaking and then like, uh, so it's gonna give you the warning. So PRAM is uh, like, that's not require so much accuracy of the noise level of things. So PRAM use more stations than IPF method. So that is one thing, but, um, also, like we do not use those commercial sensor, like com private company sensor from private company because Japanese law only JMA can provide warning. So JMA all controls all the seismic network, but there are some uh, difference between the network of RAM and the IPF because IPF requires more accuracy for the quiet sensors for the the algorithm. Yeah, can I ask a, a, a quick question uh, emerging from that one? So, so that has uh, JMA got some mm -hmm. uh, sort of a distributed cent uh, processing centers we are in a, in a major centers uh, rather than coming to Tokyo processing center or, uh, or a central place where all the data process from uh, sensors belong to JMA. Some of the data also process uh, in a in a different prefectures or regions, Masubi-san? Mm. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, actually like each uh, each station has like pre-processing the data. So actually uh, like it, besides those uh, waveform itself, they also use those P-wave trigger is actually processed at each station. And it's all the information is gathered to the Tokyo center. But there are another to Osaka center, there are two main the central centers. So if one is broken, the other one will recover. So there are two main central stations, but all the seismic uh, information will be, yeah, like gathered to those Osaka center and Tokyo center. Thank you, Masumi. And thank you everyone for your questions. Really great discussion from everyone. And thank you for um, yeah, uh, putting on those questions and to Masumi for answering and uh, all of um, the curious people. Um, and yeah, so I'll just hand it back, back to, to Alicia. Alicia. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone to attending and um, arigato gozaimashita Masumi Yamada. Um, and we will upload the video, the recording video, um, once it was successfully uploaded to my uh, computer and shared it onto our YouTube channel. And I will share with um, everything in your email. So yeah. And uh, we will continue to let you know who will be our next speaker. And thank you very much everyone for joining us today. And hopefully have a nice rest of the day.
Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks so much, Masumi. It was great. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, it was good to see you. Sometimes yeah. be nice to catch up. <laughs> For real. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Good. Bye. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Thank you. Bye.